let's see how professional this is. It's uh Wow, that works pretty well. That was like that was oddly professional. I've never done that before, but like the guys that on the channel were like, "Yo, you should do this feature when you do the YouTube videos." So oh, so this is going on YouTube? Yeah, yeah, heck oh. yeah, this is going on YouTube. So My background you look looks like shit. So, <laughs> it's, all right. not, it's just not. normal. That's that's normal. So, <laughs> reality, no, no stress. But anyways, guys, welcome back to another episode of Coffee and Van Chats. My name is John Croom. Uh, we're sitting here with Scott McGill, and everybody's probably wondering who the fuck's Scott McGill. He was in the breakaway for like 200 kilometers in uh, Australia with Road Worlds. He's been winning road races with wildlife all season long. And so, Scott, who the fuck are you, man? <laughs> I'm just a dude. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just a dude. Well, let's, well, let's dive into you just being a dude a little bit. Um, I mean, currently there's a hurricane going on where you're at. You, you live in North Carolina, yeah? uh maryland i went to school in north carolina okay so that's where i've met you like just the run-ins in north carolina yeah doing some local gravel racing and and stuff like that but what's your background like how do you how do you find yourself you know ending up lining up with the world's best at uh at world championships this year uh i start i guess i started riding like mountain biking with my dad when i was maybe seven or eight really and then started doing mountain bike races um from when i was like nine till maybe 16 yeah then i started racing on the road a little bit just to like mix it up and then i kind of switched completely uh to the road still did mountain biking like a uh, collegiate races and stuff um i went to brevard college okay so we, i did like pretty much everything like i would do the downhill the dual slalom you know all, all the events uh yeah that was, that was super fun and then did a little bit of cyclocross here and there. And then last year did a full season of cyclocross. Um, and was able you to did pretty it. well too, didn't you? Yeah, I made it to the Worlds in the U.S. So that was cool for like yeah. the first full season. Um, so yeah, this is like my second Worlds this year, which is cool. Good experience. But first Worlds on the road, like that's a hard selection to make. For a lot of people that don't know like how selection works and how the selection process works, like it's... It's kind of intense. It's almost like, yeah, if you haven't won a world tour race, like it's all up to the coach. Yeah, there's like all these criteria that you they post, but it's all like, yeah, if you've won a podiumed the world championships last year or yeah, yeah, a world tour race, it's like, okay, how many guys have like done? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a, that's always a funny one. It's like automatic selections, like either you've won the Olympics or you've podiumed at worlds or something like that, or like you podiumed at. Uh, you know, you podiumed at those two events. And so, yeah, selection's like really hard to make. So like, were you even vying for a road world start? Like, what was your goal going into the season? Because you've had like a pretty epic season. And guys, if you if you haven't like seen already, like you should definitely go like look at like some of the stage races that wildlife's been to. Because I mean, you've been up there in, in some top finishes in, in these stage races. Yeah, so like for the worlds after I was in, when we raced in Portugal, I uh, I won the the first stage. There was a prologue the day before, but like it was stage one. Yeah, and then I think Mike Creed. I was texting him after the race, who's the director of Evolo. Um, has he been on this podcast before? Hell yeah, Mike okay. Creed's been on okay. this podcast. <laughs> I thought yeah. so. Yeah, yeah. And he was texting me. He's like, "Oh, that might be like an auto qualifier for Worlds." And I was like, "So that was like the first time it crossed my mind." And then yeah. A couple days late, I won another stage like five days later. And then I was like, oh, I should like look into the world's thing. Like maybe I'll be able to go. <laughs> and then it was it was like that day was like the deadline to submit the petition form or whatever. Yeah. So it was good that I looked at it that that day. And then, yeah. And then it was like with all the relegation battles and stuff. And yeah. it being in Australia, which is like super far away. Not, you know. What like, relegation battles are you talking about? What do you mean? Like with the world tour teams. Oh yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, okay, guy, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm I know on. that uh, Mateo Jorgensen like couldn't go or wasn't allowed to go because Movistar oh, wow. was like in the relegation battle um, mm -hmm. with the bottom teams of the World Tour, and like Nielsen didn't know if he was going to go until like a week before he he went. Um, so uh, yeah, and then I got the opportunity to go, 
And yeah, it was good. I was about to say, I felt like they wrote a whole article about how Nielsen wasn't going, Los Incratics, visas denied. Which, what's that's about? What is, you know, do you know anything yeah. about that? I don't know. Cause like I was like two days before I was supposed to leave, I got a text like, make sure you have your visa. And I was like, I didn't even know I needed a visa. <laughs> for Australia? Yeah. I didn't. I, I would guess you would need a visa for Australia, but that's probably like a more of a COVID thing more than anything, right? Yeah, I went in in 2020 to do the Herald Sun tour with Evolo, and I don't yeah. remember it being like I needed a visa, so I was like, I didn't, I didn't figure I needed one. But then they they have like this work visa that we had to do. Yeah, technically, I guess we're working, even though nobody's getting <laughs> paid to get there. <laughs> the irony. The irony. Yeah. Yeah. But so I had filled that out and then they had it like rushed. Um, and then I, yeah, so I don't know. But then they didn't even ask for it when I got there. So I was like kind of pissed that I had it, paid money for it. And to spend so time did you have it. to, did you have to pay for all, all the money for it and everything? Or did USA Cycling pick up the bill? Or, uh, I, I paid for my own flight. Yeah. So yeah, not too bad. Yeah. So you got, you got this opportunity. And so what, I guess, what was your goal going into the race? Like, I mean, my thing is, is like, you know, it's what, is this, is this your first year pro pro? Like you were on a Volo. Um, and then I guess what is, I guess, continental as well. Yeah. Life? When I, uh, yeah, kind of a Volo was continental as well. Oh, when, when you were on it. it? They, yeah. They yeah. Are it now just because they had more access to more races. Yeah. I and mean, they're not continental. And then wildlife is a continental team. Um, yeah. But we do like we try to do the highest level races we can, like mm-hmm. two point ones and pro series races, rather than a lot of two point twos. Like what like Joe Martin is a two point two. We did Joe Martin. Um, but then like if we go like we did tour of Turkey, tour of Rwanda, tour of Antalya, and tour of Portugal, which are all two point one and above. Yeah. So there'll be like a few world tour teams there and then a, a good amount of pro continental teams and then some continental teams too. Yeah, and so I guess what I'm trying to allude to is like, you know, you've had a pretty fucking good season, especially for an American. What are you What are you doing next year? Can you talk about that or? Uh, I don't know yet. (laughs) Yeah, and so like, are you talking to anyone? Like, and you you don't have to mention any teams, but like, there was a. Did you see that Phil Guyman tweet about you? Uh yeah, somebody sent it to me. I don't I don't do Twitter, so I didn't. Yeah, see neither it, do I. I don't usually do Twitter either, but that was sent to me, and then that's when I was like, oh, we should do a podcast. And because uh, I was like, I was like, how have I not done a podcast with Scott yet? Like we've ridden bikes, we've you know, like we've been we've been around, and I just don't know why we haven't done it. But this is perfect, like with the After Worlds thing. But I saw the I saw the tweet, which I'll put a link down in the description below. Like we don't even really talk about it because I mean, was that the one with Keegan? Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, I guess we're going to talk about it. Um, yeah, I guess <laughs> like, I didn't want to like throw Keegan under the bus, but it, it did make sense. It's like, you know, a lot of people are talking about Keegan, but nobody's talking about you and a lot of people like, you know what I mean? And, uh, but I mean, that's, it's clicks, right? Um, it's, I, I get it. It's media, but I guess my thing is, is like, what was your expectation going into worlds? Um, I mean, looking at the, like the course profile, I, uh, didn't realize how hard of a course it was going to be like that climb in yeah. the circuits. I don't know if you, how much you know about it, but there was a pretty tough climb that we did 12 times. And like when we first got there, I didn't even look at the climb. Cause I figured I got, I got there like nine days before the race. Like I got plenty of time to look at this climb when the course is closed and everything. And I, I was joking. I was like, if I saw this climb when I first got here, I would have just booked a flight home. Cause it's like, <laughs> freaking hard well i'm not gonna lie dude i saw you in the when you were in the break you looked buckled on the back of that climb. yeah i think that's just, just more the way i ride a lot too like I'm yeah not like a super like i'm all over the place but the way yeah. i am on a bike uh yeah. so that probably has something to do with it but then i was our plan going into the race was like i was going to kind of look for the break on the highway section before the first big climb which was like a 6k climb yeah. Um. In case the race blew up on that, which it did behind, but I was already in the breakaway, so I kind of got a head start and tried to get ahead of the race a bit, so that when eventually Nielsen or Magnus or maybe even like Keegan came up in a group, I was there already ahead of the race and didn't have to 
like attack with the big riders. Um, yeah. So and then it's a little bit easier in the break when you're on a circuit like that or going up a steep climb like that because you can just take it easy on the climb and then rotate for the rest of the course in the breakaway. Yeah. Were they taking it easy on the climb? Uh, I mean, it wasn't easy, but <laughs> well, I, mean, I, I know, but the... trying to follow Remco up the thing, yeah, yeah. With the, well, the way the way you made it sound, you're like, yeah, yeah, we'll just like rotate and then we'll like take it easy up the thing, and I was like, Jesus Christ, and so. I guess, did you find yourself, like, when you found yourself sitting... So that was kind of the plan, you being in that break. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And, and, and then so, Nielsen, a group with Nielsen came up, um, like, with Remco, which eventually was where Remco, like, attacked from. Yeah. And won the race. And I'd like to think I tried to help Nielsen a little bit. I mean, there's not... Like, I was trying to position him into the climb a little bit and just kind of be there in case he needed anything. I don't... I. I probably didn't do much, but I was there. <laughs> yeah. And what's that like? I guess because, you know, when with all the different guys and all the different teams and all, really all the different levels of athlete, like what was it like, I guess, coming into this fold of guys, you know, who I guess are superstars in their own right of American cycling. And then, you know, you got you, Keegan, and um, some other guys coming through and, and, and riding and, you know, was it, were they pretty open to feedback? Were they pretty open to like helping you kind of get settled or was it just kind of like a boom, we race them. We're on a plane and we're done. We don't talk anymore. <laughs> um, I mean, it was like, I, we definitely left after the right, the day after the race. But, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's kind of weird when you only do one race a year, like uh, with USA cycling. Um, cause it takes a while to like get to know your, how your teammates ride and, and just the, the little things each person does and like try to know how to help somebody on your team. Um, yeah. Like I know with, with me and Noah Grant again, my teammate this year, it kind of took, I don't know. It, it didn't take too long, but like it took a few races for us to really get to like, for me to know how he does the lead out and for him to know kind of what I want from the lead out um yeah and we didn't really have a chance to do any like like you just do one race together so it was kind of like i wouldn't say a free-for-all with you at, with uh, at the worlds but like kind of everyone had their little opportunity you know um to make the race for themselves yeah yeah and so what i guess my guess my thing is is like you know what do you what do you do like after that? And I guess it, I know I know you kind of were like, yeah, I don't know, but like I heard you're building cycle cross bikes. So I guess are you riding with wildlife or like what's that look like? Uh, I guess I'm riding with wildlife. I mean, I'm, I'm like kind of just doing a few races. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's it's a lot of the support is on my own. Um, for yeah. cross for sure, which like it, yeah, that's that's fine. I mean it's a road team so yeah i don't expect yeah. anything um is there any is there any cyclocross teams anymore really that you can like pro uh, i mean because cannondale folded right and, yeah the blue team is actually staying at my house right now um, oh wow in between rochester and charm city which are two cross races they came and stayed uh and then they'll go to the world cup but because i live in, in near baltimore and that's where the race is this weekend Okay. Okay. And so you're building up. So you're, you're jet lagged. Yeah. You're building up two bikes and then you're racing this weekend. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, uh, still got some work to do and it's what 5 PM on Friday, the night before the race. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I won't keep you too long. I need like at least 15 <laughs> no more minutes out of you, but, um, but yeah, so I guess, I guess my question to you is, is like, you know, when do you rest dude? Cause it's like, you pretty much came off cycle cross worlds and then dove straight in head first with wildlife. And then yeah. you just got off a flight. What was it? We were, we were texting back and forth. And I think you said you were flying out on Monday and I told you I'd give you 48 hours to like get your brain back yeah. together. So you weren't <laughs> like complete scrambled eggs when we had a conversation. And so when do you rest, bro? Cause like you're going straight into some pretty high intensity, I guess. Right. Yeah, so like last year after cross nationals, I took like a two week break, like you know normal, and then just trained for like a week. Then got COVID, so then took another two weeks off, and then trained for like another week, and then raced the worlds, which obviously wasn't 
good prep idea. for cross yeah. worlds to not yeah, ideal. Have, have so much time off. And then immediately flew to Turkey and started racing again. So I never really like trained <laughs> coming into this year. Yeah. Until, like, like, I mean, it, I was training obviously, but it's not like I did like a three month like base period or anything like that. Yeah. Um, and then after, so then I, I've been racing almost, I haven't taken more than two weeks off of racing since then till now. And then, How do you manage I- that, dude? <laughs> no, like seriously, like mentally, like I just get fucked with all that racing in the hotel. Like I'm in a hotel right now. It's got the irony, but like all the travel and 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 all that other stuff, and and then with the racing and like the food, it, like how do you manage that, dude? I don't know. I just like doing it. Um, especially, I mean, on wildlife, it's like we're all pretty good friends, and it's a good group of guys. Like, so I look forward to hanging out and kind of i mean we get to travel travel the world for for free basically which is a you know i don't like to go to a race just to travel somewhere yeah i like to go to the race to race but like this year i've raced on five continents jeez yeah it's a lot (laughs) did you get did you get airline status at all or did you fly Uh, yeah i just got some status with united there you go. Congrats, yeah. congrats, congrats. That makes life a little easier, right? Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah. And so I guess, you know, with you racing uh, cycle cross, I mean, is it just like, are you just using this to collect fitness for ro- like, where do you see Scott going? You know, I guess is my main question. It's like, I mean, again, you know, when I raced you, it was like, okay, you were on a Volo, I think. I think you were on a Volo and you were you were doing a gravel race, yeah. And so that's the classic gravel racing. It's it's always funny because it's like a mixture. Usually that front group, depending on the gravel race, it's like it's a mixture of like half retired, um, half like just insanely strong dudes, and then the or I mean a third. So it's like a third retired guys that do gravel, and then like a third of just these like insanely strong dudes that I've never heard of. And then it's like a third of like professional road racers, professional track racers, professional, like they just do different shit. And so I guess like, where does Scott see himself in five years? Like what is Scott's, <laughs> where, what is, what is Scott's business goal? <laughs> I don't know. I'm just kind of going with the flow now. Like um, whatever you can get, you just kind of yeah. take it kind of thing. I mean, I like, I like doing cross. That's like, or I wouldn't do it if I didn't like doing it. No, um, for sure. But, yeah. but, but like. I mean, there's a lot of people that like doing certain things, but they understand that they have to make a sacrifice somewhere to like go world tour or like, yeah, exactly. or vice versa. Right. Like, so it's like, oh, I like doing cross, but I need, or, I mean, I like doing the road, but like, I really think I could do really well at this cross thing. And I want to make sure I have a really solid cross season. And so, and I mean, I know you're a coach, right? Like you work with the, the ignition stuff with, yeah. uh, with, um, Dylan Johnson and those guys. And so you would even look at one of your athletes and be like, bro, you know, like where are you, you know what I mean? And so it's, it's like the, do you practice what you preach kind of thing? But at the end of the uh, same time, it's like, I don't know. You go, yeah. you get where I'm going. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to definitely going to take a break after this weekend. Um, yeah. Take like an off season and then do like late season cross into nationals, um, yeah. which will hopefully have a better result at nationals. Cause I won't be so smoked by the time I get to nationals, but definitely for me, like say I took my off season now and didn't race till February. I need like, I would just like find something else to do to take up all my time. Ah, where, I get like, you. And then I would like get too far away from training. Like I need to have like some competition lined up to, to keep focused. Um, See, I'm so oddly envious of guys like you, like guys <laughs> that can just like constantly race into fitness. Because I feel like if I don't train, I just it's a shot race for me. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So I, I yeah, it's it's tough trying to balance racing like year round basically. But um, I mean, I it, I definitely think that's the best thing for me. Yeah, is to keep kind of keep, always keep it in your mind. Uh, that you have a race coming up yeah and so i guess again back to kind of the question is like do you want to go world tour like do you want to or is it just like whatever happens i'll entertain the idea but like are you put because like are you putting feelers out there or like um i i have an agent now so 
Oh, I'm trying to let him do fancy, the work. Fancy. Uh, so, <laughs> yes, if I got an offer from a world tour team, I would like you know jump on that it. in a heartbeat. Um, yeah, but I think I'm you know nobody wants to sign a 24 year old anymore. Is that really how yeah. young you are? <laughs> yeah, I'm 24. I do. I'm not gonna lie. I thought you were older. No, I just turned wow. 24. That's insane. And so, like, you still have time, dude. I mean, like, what? Mike Woods, Travis McCabe, Keel yeah. Ryan, like, all I mean, these there's guys definitely there's definitely examples of it, but that's just the way it seems it's going now. Is if you're that's not a good some, point, you know, every team wants the next superstar. They don't just want like a, a solid rider that they know. I guess be. Egan. I guess Egan Bernal set that precedent, huh? Yeah, and then Remco is signed as a junior, and now he's world champ. So yeah, it's yeah, just kind of the way it's going. Looking at Magnus, you know, just kind of yeah. goes on the list. Yeah, exactly. Well, and I, but I, we still got like Optum and, and a few other teams and like uh, Wildlife. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's it's definitely getting late in the year, but I still don't, don't know what I'm doing next year. So. Oh, man. <laughs> well, <laughs> I guess – you know, so with cross, like, is your goal to go back to worlds or is your goal to, uh, you know, go shoot for nationals or what's, what's the, I guess, over uh, the goal? probably just shoot for nationals and, um, I'll see what, what next year is going to look like Yeah. by the time nationals comes around, like the spring. And, you know, if it's going to be a pretty open spring, then maybe I'll go to Europe for the, for the Christmas block of cross. Um, but if I'm going to start racing in like February, then I'll take a break after nationals again and hopefully not get COVID this time. And then I, I, if I can get enough points with a few races I'm doing to go to worlds, like if I'm like riding at a high level, then I'll go, but I'm not going to make it a priority to, I'm not going to go points chasing. Like I'm skipping the world cups um, that are the fo- ne- the next couple weeks just cause yeah. they're far from, I can't drive. Like I could drive to them, but it's far in Wisconsin and uh, Arkansas. So like the rest of the races I'm going to do are going to be within an eight hour drive of my house. Um, eight hour drive. Yeah. Yeah. Which is close for the, for the U. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess it's pretty close. Yeah. It's just like, man, that's savage. Eight hour drive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You got to do what you got to do though. Yeah. And so I guess, uh, let's dive in a little bit about your coaching before we kind of turn out his, you know, um, you and I chatted before about uh, ignition and all the stuff that you guys have going on. So, how did that like come come about and come to come together, like with you working with uh, Dylan Johnson? Uh, well, I've known Dylan for a while since I because we went to school together. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I've known him since I was like seven, seventeen when I was a freshman, and then I yeah. still go down and stay at his house to train sometimes. Um, yeah. And then he was starting a coaching company, and I said, "Yeah, sure, I'll." It's it's you know a good way to make make money because you don't get paid a whole lot as a continental level cyclist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you got to do something, and it's hard to do kind of anything else when you're traveling so much. Um, so it's like, and and it's you know somewhat enjoyable to work with other athletes. Yeah, no, that's sick, man. And it's try to pass kind of- on some kind of experience that I've learned. Yeah, I mean, it's, well, it sounds like you've learned a lot. I mean, basically, <laughs> I'm like, what, five continents in the last, what is it, 10 months at this point? Like, pretty much from January to, to now, right? You've yeah. You've been on five yeah. continents. Yeah, exactly. It's fucking mental. It's fucking mental. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but anyways, before, before I let you roll, I got one last question for you. And I ask everybody this, and I, I guess you've listened to the podcast before. And so, uh, if you could have a cup of coffee with any person in the world that are alive, who would that person be and why? And then how would you take your coffee? Uh, well, I definitely take my coffee black and like a lot of it. And yeah. <laughs> any coffee, as long as it's strong enough, I don't care if it's Maxwell house or some bougie roastery or whatever you want to yeah. call it. And you just want it black and strong. Place. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> as long as it's black and hot and a lot of it, that's all I need. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'd probably say uh, Ray Lewis. You know who he is? Yeah, yeah, football player. Yeah. So I got to meet him uh, during during the Maryland Cycling Classic. He was yeah. like an ambassador. He's like a big cyclist now. Yeah. No I'm shit. From, yeah. Yeah. Because I'm from the Baltimore area. I mean, I've like 
growing up, everyone had a Ray Lewis jersey. People still wear a Ray Lewis jerseys, even though he's been retired for like 10 years. Yeah. But, and he was, you know, when I, we met him, he was like in his like business mode, like, you know, shaking hands. He's got a really firm handshake. <laughs> and he's like, right you know, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. But I'd like to like, you know, sit down with him and have a couple just of chat. Time. What would you chat to him about? Like, what would like, why Ray Lewis? Cycling. I mean, I've heard that he, he picked up the bike uh, in the last year of his career. And he said oh, he, shit. Was, he's the best. He was in the best shape he's been in, in his whole life after he started cycling. And he was just like pissed. He didn't find it until the last year. Um Wow. So kind of how that and, and kind of what it's like comparing football to cycling or I'm not like a huge football fan, but he's kind of yeah. like an icon in Baltimore. Just in, in Baltimore area. Yeah. 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 No, I can understand that. Like and I guess with that with that Maryland race, not to like kind of completely tune off, but I know that you you know, with that being in your hometown, what do you think that that's looking like for the future of the sport? Like, do you think it's going to stick around or do you think it was kind uh, of like a one trick wonder kind of thing? Yeah, so I was able to do it this year with the with the national team. Um, yeah, and it was seemed like it was hugely successful. I mean, they were talking about it on the news for days after, like the economic impact it had on the city and stuff like that. So usually, when something makes money, it sticks around. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so for hopefully, sure. it'll be around for a while. Uh, they're definitely talking about adding a women's race next year, which yeah. would be good because this year it was just just men's race. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I hope it stays around and I get to do it for years to come. Nah, that'd be sick, man. Well, hey, guys, if you haven't already, please make sure you go check out Scott McGill's social media. I'll put a link down in the description below. Also, I will put a link down for Ignition Coaching. If you're looking for coaching, don't hesitate to reach out to the boys and let them know that I said hey and let them know that we sent you and you were listening to this podcast. But uh, anyways, other than that, we'll see you next time, guys. Uh, yeah, cheers.